so hello everybody um, and a big welcome to this first event in the sixth annual TPOP series of, e of events. Um, I was just saying I can't actually see any of you so this is um, yeah talking talking to my screen so I hope you're, you're all there and you're having a nice day. Um, my name's Nikki Newton for anyone who uh, hasn't met me before um, and I'm the TPOP lead at JNCC. Um, so uh, as you can all see we're online again for the third year in a row um, which has worked quite well um, and effectively over the past couple of years in making these events more inclusive to more colleagues across and beyond TPOP organisations um, and thanks very much in advance to everybody for coming along today and contributing their talks and thoughts um, because I know it's uh, a busy time of year for lots of us. Um, and we will be recording the talks in this event to share on YouTube um, at a later date, hopefully quite soon, um, for anyone who's not able to make the session today, if you've got any colleagues who want to hear about it. So I know uh, lots of you will have seen variants of this slide before, um, but for those less familiar with UK TPOP, um, I thought I'd just do a bit of a, an acronym deciphering session. Um, it, it gives you a bit of a crib sheet as to all the scheme acronyms on there, as well as um, TPOP. So on this slide, we've got um, the organisations in the box on the left um, in various combinations run, um, fund, organise and steer the terrestrial monitoring and surveillance in the box on the right. So UK TPOP or TPOP um, is the UK Terrestrial Evidence Partnership of Partnerships um, and it was created to bring together JNCC's partners working in the field of terrestrial ecology um, on biodiversity surveillance and monitoring. Um, to share guidance and um, help communication across the sector. So the underlying principles are those of collaboration and knowledge exchange um, with the benefits of enhancing efficient and effective joint working um, because lots of the challenges or opportunities relevant for engaging volunteers with monitoring one taxon um, are also relevant for another one. So it's beneficial for us to work together in a lot of ways. Um, and since TPOP was founded six years ago, we've expanded um, the official kind of TPOP network to welcome lots of other organisations who are keen to collaborate in our discussions. So welcome to everybody today. Um, so our programme of events for this year has um, four events that you've hopefully already heard about from the flyer we sent around, plus another event that follows on from um, event four um, for those of you, of you who are interested in attending it. Um, so we're kicking off with today's event where we're going to hear from lots of our scheme partners about key challenges um, that they face this year um, and we've got time for a couple of discussion sessions on topics that are hopefully relevant for many of you here today as well. Um, the second event uh, next Monday will be led by David Roy at UKCEH and has a focus on um, the biological recording verification um, and analysis partnership. Um, and interpretation, missed out the interpretation, um, and it's looking at how Brevi supports um, this data journey from kind of collection to application. Then the third event, which is led by Mo Michael Pocock at UKCEH, will focus on a couple of tools that have been developed to support um, targeting of citizen science efforts, um, and this follows on quite nicely from one of our discussion sessions later on today, um, and the event also thinks more about the opportunities for fine scale modelled biodiversity data sets to a range of scales, which also has some nice links to this, uh, our other discussion topic today. Um, and then the fourth event this year will be a, an event of two halves. Um, the first will give a quick introduction to the refreshed terrestrial surveillance development and analysis partnership, um, which we're, we'll be looking at the strategy we've been developing um, and introducing some of the work that we're planning on um, undertaking that's aligned to this new strategy. Um, and then the second half of the um, of event will consider equality, diversity and inclusion in schemes. Um, firstly, looking at the demographic surveys that some schemes have undertaken um, in the last year and the lessons learned from these. Um, and then we're also going to be thinking a bit about JNCC's support for EDI action in TPOP schemes. And then the final event, which we haven't really publicised until this point, <laughs> Um, is a follow on from the TSDA section of event four um, and it's going to run as a series of sort of half hour drop in sessions throughout the morning um, for anyone interested in learning more about particular tasks um, or that will be introduced on the 1st of November um, or if you're interested in getting involved in steering those tasks um, we would love to welcome you along for a bit more of a discussion about them. So please do put any events that you're interested in joining in your diary um, and contact us for more information on registering for events three and four if you want anything. Um, so 
on to today's event um, after that introduction of the whole series. Um, we're starting off with a series of six minute talks from across our scheme partners. Um, in order to keep these talks quite concise uh, in the context of what's already a three hour event, um, we've asked our partners to keep the sort of general scheme context presented to a minimum and focus on um, sort of three points um, like a, a challenge that they faced this year, um, how how they addressed it and what were the sort of key findings and lessons learned. Um, so I'm aware some people on the call might not be as familiar with the sort of um, basics of the scheme. So if you want to find out any more general information about them, um, then I do recommend all the scheme websites or do get in touch and we can have a chat about them sometime if you want to learn about them more in a more general context. So we'll have a break in the middle of the presentations um, and at the end of the whole set briefly before we head out into some breakout rooms uh, for just over an hour later on to discuss two topics which I'll introduce to you later and then we'll reconvene about quarter past one for a quick feedback session um, and we'll close probably at half past one because I expect we'll all be very hungry for our lunch then. Um, so I just wanted to give a very quick update from a JNCC perspective. Um, given that we've asked you to all give an update from your perspective. <laughs> um, so um, our organisation has been very busy working on developing a new organisational strategy this year, which is due to be published next spring. Um, so we can't say a huge amount about it now, but um, it's a sort of watch this space for that. Um, there have been lots of team and organisational changes in um, the ecosystems analysis team, um, which is my team at JNCC, um, where we sort of uh, run um, these surveillance schemes with you. Um, um, so there may be new JNCC staff in touch about various projects over the next few months. Um, we've been uh, undertaking a lot of renegotiations with many of you, as you're all very aware. Um, so our species surveillance partnerships uh, generally operate on um, five year contractual agreements, and many of these ended last year. Um, so we needed to have some renegotiation discussions to sort of reform partnerships and continue support for the schemes. Um, so we've successfully completed renegotiations for the BTO partnership and national bat monitoring program. Um, and after an open competition, um, the TSDA partnership will continue with the former partnership of JNCC, BTO and UKCEH. Um, and as I mentioned, we're working on a new strategy to steer our work up to 20, 2027. So more on that on the 1st of November. Um, management of the Goose and Swan monitoring programme moved from um, uh, WWT to BTO and um, the Seabird monitoring programme, which was previously managed within JNCC, um, has also moved to being managed by BTO. And we're going to hear about um, that later on from Dawn. Um, and all of our other schemes, I think it's right to say, are currently um, in the process of being renegotiated um, as many of the current agreements end at the end of this coming March. So hopefully we'll be all concluded by next spring. Um, and as I said, huge thanks to everyone involved with these renegotiations um, as they're lots of work and involve lots of meetings and are quite time consuming. Um, but it's a, been a pleasure working with all of you um, to think about our schemes going forward into the future. Um, and another big area of work we've been thinking about in our team um, is uh, considering how we might most effectively support the collection of more um, local or regional biodiversity data to better understand um, local biodiversity change. So um, this aligns with the ambitions set out um, within the JNCC Terrestrial Biodiversity Evidence Strategy. Um, and it's also an area of work supported through initiatives such as um, DEFRA's Natural Capital and Ecosystems Analysis Programme um, in England. Um, and we're having conversations across UK countries to understand ambitions and potential opportunities for this area of work. Um, it's an area that does come with uh, quite a few challenges um, and this links into some of the discussions that we're going to be having later on today. So that is enough from me now, um, not to overschedule at, at least at this point. So we're now moving on to a series of six minute talks from our scheme partners. Um, I think Kirsty or Chloe are going to be watching the, the clock. Um, for sort of timing between six or seven minutes so we don't um, fall too behind schedule and I'll be clicking through um, the slides uh, to save us switching through presentations so speakers do um, shout when you want me to click forward for you. Um, so our first speaker, um, can, please can we welcome Rachel Murphy from Plant Life who's hopefully on the line um, to talk about the NPMS. 
Hi, yes, I am here <laughs> and I'm the manager, uh, the volunteer manager for the National Plant Monitoring Scheme. If we could just click on, uh, please. Thank you. Um, so for which we have nearly 1,700 surveyors currently allocated, just over uh, 1,900 uh, monads, one kilometre monads nationwide to survey plant species. And we currently, if, if you want to just click everything onto that, um, that slide there, Nikki. Thank you. Um, we currently have nearly a thousand uh, squares for which we have data for at least one year, and we have a number, quite a large number of squares for which we have data for two or three or even more years consistently up to seven years worth of data for over 50 of our squares. Um, of course, I'm showing some comparison figures here for just data up to 2021 because it is still early days for this season with our volunteers still submitting their data for this year. But so far we have received data for around 200 squares, which equates to around 1,300 samples so far this year, and that is still rising. If you want to just click on please, Nikki, thanks. Um, but aside from our survey season, it's been a super busy year for MPMS with the launch of our first MPMS annual report and our regular support in newsletters and comms, and of course our popular MPMS support training series. And indeed, we've published the 2015 to 21 data set on the EDIC, but there have also been a number of challenges and reviews this season, um, including um, just two key areas that I'm going to chat about today relating to volunteer engagement and participation. If you want to click on it, Nikki, thanks. Um, the first one relates to what we are calling our pyramid of participation, um, where there's a large number of people interested in the scheme and registering to find out more. We then move up to a second stage, which is slightly smaller, but still a really large pool um, of volunteers that are allocated to squares, a subset of which are then active and they're represented here um, on our pyramid as stage three. And they are volunteers who are not yet quite at the recording um, and data entry stage, but they are active. They're out on site. They're getting to know the methodology and wrecking their plots and so on. And we know that this stage takes effort and time before surveys even start. And so they can be the, that can be the first hurdle for our volunteers. And lastly, we've got that sort of narrow tip of our pyramid here with uh, those volunteers that are submitting their data. And our experience over the last eight years suggests that the most significant leap, and so the challenge that we're focusing on here is between people taking on a square and then actually completing their surveys. So if Nikki, you just want to just click on here our plans because to facilitate the volunteer transition up this pyramid, it's really useful to review and understand barriers. Um, to these allocated volunteers actually heading out and conducting their surveys. So we've used a combination really of volunteer questionnaire and more general volunteer feedback. So if you just want to click on to the next page, which just shows that our findings suggest that the key barriers uh, for surveyors that can prevent further participation at this stage are a perceived sort of complex methodology and lack of confidence in survey or ID skills, uh, the time required especially if that initial prep stage I mentioned puts people off and also the pursuit of land access. I'm not necessarily talking here about being granted that access, but just the process of seeking out um, and making contact can be a bit daunting. I've also noted here on the next click um, that we have had a bit of a theme from volunteers um, wanting basically increased feedback on their own personal data. So essentially greater transparency on the verification process and just reassurance that they personally are providing correct and, and valuable data to the scheme. And throughout the years, we've been continually developing improved and varied support for this stage. And I just popped some examples on here for the next click of some of the things that we've been doing this year as a result of this recent feedback. Uh, namely, we have been building um, on our guidance and training materials and providing these videos for volunteers to watch as needed in their own time, but with more provision this year towards methods and setup guidance. So videos of us, um, myself and, and Sarah here on the call, um, actually out in the field uh, setting up our plots, recording um, and assessing habitat type, for example. And we've really found that these shorter, more direct how to videos have been really popular uh, alongside our longer webinar recording and our YouTube channel is recording a huge number of views actually, especially since January this year. So we've got a quite a few further plans of things we'd like to add on there uh, over the next year. Uh, there's also um, been updates to how the data verification process uh, is communicated to volunteers with additional information on the MPMS website. So the surveyors are now able to see verification messages directly from the verifiers onto their MPMS account. And we really hope that this new information will support surveyors in their plant ID and providing some more confidence and perhaps some more learning opportunities that perhaps may have been missed previously. 
So on the next slide, I've just shown that something else this year we wanted to investigate was MPMS equality, diversity and inclusion. And so a EDI review was carried out at the start of the year, which I'm just going to really briefly summarise today because as Nikki said earlier, um, I'm actually going to be presenting more on how we went about this um, and our findings at the TPOP event in November. But if you click Nikki, it will show that essentially MPMS volunteers were invited to complete an anonymous survey to understand our current demographic um, of our participants and also to provide an opportunity to review inclusivity to the scheme. So my last slide um, here moving on uh, just pulls out some of those key take homes uh, today and overall we did find that our volunteers do fall within a fairly narrow demographic uh, with the vast majority responding that they are white British uh, mostly in England and above 55 years of age with only two percent responding that they consider themselves to be disabled. Um, also of note um, in the next box down shows that we appear to be recruiting volunteers from an already engaged audience with over 70 percent already involved in another form of environmental volunteering um, and two thirds having previous biological recording experience. Uh, it was useful to learn actually that a third um, of our volunteers don't currently feel that connected to other volunteers. So that's something for us to keep in mind and with how we can get them more connected. Um, so if you just click on, we can see that along with informing our own recommendations, it's been really helpful. It's been a really helpful exercise to receive suggestions from the participants themselves on ways that the scheme may be more inclusive. So, for example, by facilitating volunteers to collect locally, something we've been working on this season through budgeting opportunities. Uh, also, survey square availability in different regions where possible, um, and we'll soon be providing or plan to provide our survey materials also in Welsh, along with other suggestions that we are taking on into the next season. So the last thing that um, I think this slide should just say is that as well as providing a snapshot of participant demographic, this review has also been used to recommend changes to the participant registration process so that we can record appropriate demographic temp characteristics continuously um, at the point of volunteers actual entry to the scheme. And that was it. That's my whistle stop tour. Thank you very much. That was wonderful, Rachel. Great whistle stop tour. Um, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, I think we'll move on to um, Martin's talk now. Um, if anyone does have any questions for Rachel, then do pop them in the chat. Um, and we can try and have a look at them later if we've got any extra time um, or we can answer them in the chat. So uh, next we are going to hear hopefully from Martin Harvey, if you're online Martin, um, from the UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology about the um, UK Pollinator Monitoring Scheme. Great, thanks Nikki. Um, hi everyone, I hope you can hear me okay. Um, <clears throat> so um, the particular focus that I wanted to talk about today was um, on our feedback to participants in UK POMS. So I'm not going to say very much about the scheme itself, but just as a very quick reminder, the Pollinator Monitoring Scheme um, is a broad partnership between UKCH and quite a range of other bodies, including several on the meeting today. Um, and we run two surveys directly from POMS, uh, but we also liaise very closely with some of the other recording schemes that focus on pollinators, such as the bees and wasps and ants recording scheme and the hoverfly recording scheme, as well as butterfly conservation and others. <clears throat> um, the two surveys that POMS runs directly, one of them is a very wide participation survey that uses the flower insect timed counts or fit counts as we call them, uh, which is a 10 minute count with a fairly simple methodology that pretty much anybody can do pretty much anywhere. Um, and then we also have a much more systematic and detailed survey that takes place in um, 75 one kilometre squares across Britain. And we are in the process of setting up uh, an additional network within Northern Ireland to extend to full UK coverage. And in those one kilometre square surveys, we run or we have a, a a wonderful team of volunteers who help us um, put out pan traps and do some systematic monitoring of um, pollinating insect numbers um, through that pan trapping methodology. Um, don't yet have many of the results in the data still coming in as Rachel said with the, the MPMS it's the same with POMS we're still in the stage of getting in our data for this year 
but it certainly looks from the fit counts that um, last year we had a very welcome increase in numbers of fit counts and this year that number has been slightly exceeded not by a huge amount it hasn't gone up exponentially this year but we have got over 3,000 fit counts contributed um, again this year which is, is excellent um okay if we can go on to the next slide So the particular issue that um, I wanted to focus on today was um, around feedback to our users, and we've always been aware that this is something that uh, we could and, and should be doing more of. Um, and earlier in 2022, we um, were able to commission Birdsong to run a participant questionnaire um, to the volunteers who take part in both of the POMS surveys. And um, uh, that was one of the um, user surveys that's been funded by JNCC and it has produced a lot of information which we are just beginning to sort of work our way through more thoroughly uh, but there's a, a lot of very useful feedback in there and one of the things that it has confirmed is that our participants would definitely welcome more um, feedback about what POMS is doing and what the results of their um, survey work add up to. And the chart that we're looking at here um, shows in the paler um, sort of what colour, not sure what colour you'd call that, but the paler colour um, is the results from our POMS participants compared against a wider benchmark within the charities sector in the darker colour. And without going into lots and lots of detail, the, the basic message is that although our participants do appreciate that they're getting feedback. They don't feel that they're getting as much as they would like um, compared to other sort of organisations in the sector. And if we go on to the next slide. So as I say, this was something that we'd already sort of suspected was the case and, and the survey results have, have confirmed this uh, and we had last year taken some steps to start to address this problem. We built in when we had the opportunity to redevelop the POMS website in 2021, we built in some interactive graphics to give people some more immediate feedback on the results coming in from the fit counts. And this year we've um, managed to increase activity on the blog posts on the website, some of which has been contributed by our partners. Um, so we, we had a very welcome blog from one of our partners in the, the BTO and the news from the use setting up POMS in Northern Ireland has also featured there. Um, so hopefully that has provided a bit of extra feedback this year. Have we gone to the next slide? And we have had a POMS mailing list since the project started, of course, but it's not one that's been uh, as organised as efficiently as it could be or, or should be. So that's another area of work at the moment is to is to try and um, streamline our mailing list, make it easier for people to get on it and indeed to get off it if they wish to, uh, and to enable more frequent communications via that route. And the other thing that we got from the Birdsong um, questionnaire was a lot of information from people about what sort of things they might like us to be doing. This does prevent, present some challenges because some of the things that people are asking for are not things that are really within the remit of POMS as it stands. Um, so the most popular request was for more training on species identification, which is not something we actually ask our volunteers to do in the POMS surveys, although it's clearly something that they're very interested in. Um, so one of the questions for us here, I think, is to what extent we can meet this within POMS or to what extent we need to get better at signposting people to all the other wonderful species resources that are out there through some of our partner recording schemes and organisations. Um, but there's a whole range of other things here that we um, are now going to be considering over the coming winter to see how much of this we can try and build into the programme for next year. And I think the final slide is next. So it won't come as a, as a surprise to anybody on the call today that um, feedback is important and our participants like it and would like more of it and we agree with them. It is something that we need to do. Uh, one of the challenges, of course, is that this all takes time, but it's time that is very worthwhile in order to um, keep our current participants involved, but also to draw more people into the scheme. Um, the fit counts in particular do have a bit of a challenge, I think, in drawing stories out of them because they don't focus on particular species. We only ask people to count species groups, and it is quite hard to 
sort of pick out simple stories. And we can't say that bumblebees have done better than butterflies this year or hoverflies have done worse than beetles. It's just not that type of data. Um, so I think there is uh, a bit of a challenge on how we actually get those messages across. But as POMS does become a genuine long term monitoring scheme, we are now into our sixth year. Um, more data and more analysis is being accumulated, of course, and we should be able to see some better messaging coming from that as well. Um, so that's that's all I had to say on that. But um, so I think the, the user questionnaire has been particularly useful and has given us some really good steers as to how we can try and ad address some of these things in the future. Thanks, Martin. That's uh, very uh, good to hear that that has proved very useful. Um, so thank you very much for that talk. That was very interesting. Um, uh, as I said before, any questions for Martin, please pop them in in the chat. Um, next, we're moving on to Ian Middlebrook, who is uh, works for Butterfly Conservation and is going to be talking um, about a challenge within the UK BMS Butterfly Monitoring Scheme. So hopefully you're there, Ian. I am, yes. Thanks very much, Nikki. Uh, hi, everyone. Great. I hope you can hear me. Uh, yes, so so today the challenge I'm talking about really is, is part of an ongoing process that, that we go through to try and improve the quality of the trends that we produce. Uh, obviously, uh, our aim as, as a monitoring scheme is to produce um, robust trends for all the UK butterfly species, and we, we still have a few gaps. Uh, if we could move on to the next slide, please. Still have a few gaps and still one or two species where perhaps the data we're collecting isn't the best data. Um, so one of one of the examples that we've moved on to recently is, is, is the purple hair streak. Um, it's a species that's not necessarily picked up very well by our standard methodology. Um, you, you probably be aware that we uh, our standard methodology is, is the is the butterfly transect, um, where people walk along a fixed route and record the butterflies that uh, come within the recording square. A sort of five meter square ahead of them as they walk along that route. Um, but the purple hair streak um, breeds in, in mature oak trees and spends most of its life uh, up in the canopy and is generally most active early in the evening, whereas obviously most, most transects are walked during the, during the best weather in, in the day and they're only looking at what's, what's near the ground. Um, so purple hair streaks only, only rarely come down to ground level. Um, and although they're quite wide, widespread, uh, particularly in southern England, and that they occur in all four countries of the UK, uh, we only see very low numbers picked up on our transects. It's picked up on enough sites to produce a trend, but we don't really know if that trend is, is representative of what's happening within its core, core breeding areas up in the canopy. Uh, so we're looking to devise a new, a new methodology. Uh, so if we move on to the next slide, please. So, so the way we've addressed it, this is uh, we started off by bringing, bringing some experts together. So we already have two or three experts that supply us with, um, with purple hair streak data at the UK BMS um, based on early evening transects surveying the canopy. Uh, but obviously each of those experts has, has been working independently. They've devised slightly different methods. Um, so the idea of, of holding the workshop to start with was to, was to bring all those ideas together, bring in all the experts, find out the best way to do it and, and agree on some sort of uh, standardised methodology that we could incorporate within the UK BMS that would be consistent and repeatable and ideally something that could be taken up um, by volunteers with less experience of that species, not necessarily novices, but people who are not experts. Um, so, so we des designed a methodology coming out of that, that, um, that workshop, which was based on our standard standard transect methodology, except that it's walked in the early evening and instead of recording uh, what flies in front of you in that five meter box, you move your recording box up to the top of the canopy. And this seemed a, seemed a fairly simple way to adjust our, our current methodology, uh, something that our volunteers would understand uh, and could be, could be trialed. So, so we started off by we contacted our, our routine volunteers uh, and, and, and looked for basically guinea pigs to give this methodology a trial in the field uh, for a season. And they did that and they gave us some brilliant feedback. Um, perhaps if I can move on to the next slide, you can just get, get an idea of what it was they were doing. So they're walking along their fixed route. Uh, they, they've designed the transit route. They're walking along at a steady pace and trying to uh, trying to count purple hair streaks up in the canopy. So they've, they've given us some brilliant feedback in terms of, oh, I've never seen so many purple hair streaks at my site. I didn't realise in, you know, that they were in these areas. So that was brilliant from that point of view. But there was also a, a recurring theme 
uh, that came back from volunteers that actually it's quite difficult to walk at a steady pace while you're staring up at the uh, staring up at the canopy. Um, so yes, thanks. Thanks for the next slide. So this is a an extract from um, uh, so I sort of collated all, all the feedback that we got from those volunteers and uh, and presented that to our steering group. And this is an expert excerpt from it, uh, if you like. So effectively identifying what was a health and safety issue with people trying to uh, trying to stare up at the canopy without looking where they're going. Um, so it did present a fundamental flaw, although there was lots of positivity about the methodology and lots of suggestions about how we could address that. Um, so we had to look at that quite seriously. And it was very tempting to go with the flow, go with the positivity, just amend the methodology um, from what had been suggested and roll it out. But we decided that, you know, we really, if, if we're going to amend it to that extent, we need to trial it again. So what, what we've done is we, we've adjusted that methodology. So they're now stopping at regular intervals for, for fixed, fi fixed periods to survey the canopy for those purple hair streaks. Um, and then we're now we've run that out this this year for a second trial. We don't we don't want to finalise a methodology without having tested it properly. Um, and we've obviously got time to get it right. So that's what we're trying to do. And it's it's been rolled out again this year. Um, and so far, the, the the feedback's been very positive and no, no major, no major drawbacks this time around. So if we can move on to the last slide, um, it's really just a sort of um, summary of what I've already been saying. But, um, in terms of devising these new methodologies to, to, to fill the gaps in our in our monitoring scheme at present, making the best use of, of the expertise that's available and to design methodologies that could bring in the most suitable data, but recognising that volunteers uh, without the same level of expertise may identify issues that those experts have, have perhaps long forgotten about and, and found their way around. Um, and then obviously, Test, test the methodology thoroughly and take feedback seriously. Don't just look at the feedback and say, oh yeah, it's mostly positive, let's get on with it. But look at it seriously, see if there are any major issues and don't be afraid to go through several iterations before finalising. So that's it, thank you. Thanks very much, Ian. That was a really nice example of uh, yeah, develop, de developing something iteratively and uh, yeah, worrying about volunteers falling into ditches, which does seem a uh, quite, quite important thing to take note of. Um, right, uh, next we're moving on to um, Leah Gilmore, um, who is the Interim Head of Science and Monitoring at the, um, uh, with the National Bat Monitoring Programme um, at the Bat Conservation Trust. Um, and uh, Leah will be our final talk before we have a bit of a break. I hope, I hope you're there, Leah. Yes, I'm here. Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, Thanks. brilliant. Thanks. OK, thanks, Nikki, for that introduction. So I'm going to go straight on to what I'm going to talk about because I've already been introduced. Next slide, please. So ours is a bit of a, a, a big problem um, and is basically tackling uh, underrepresentation in bat monitoring. So when you hear underrepresentation, you often think of uh, volunteer engagement, um, equality or equity, diversity and inclusion. But as well as this, um, we have a few things underrepresented in our monitoring, including certain types of habitats, for example, sort of upland areas and, and, and also areas in, in um, certain regions such as Wales and Scotland, um, which, uh, which are sort of underrepresented in, in our monitoring. Um, we also have a number of species that for various reasons have been underrepresented and although we do uh, have trends for, for a good number of species, for uh, nine this year but normally ten, um, there are a few that need sort of some focus. So plans to plug these gaps in monitoring include some passive acoustic monitoring surveys using our um, sound classification system that um, we've been developing. And the two surveys that I'm going to talk about are the British Bat Survey uh, or BBATS uh, and Night Watch um, Survey. So next slide, please. So as part of the uh, British Bat Survey, we've developed the automated sound classification system. So this, this system um, basically starts um, with uh, recording of the sound data uh, and upload, and then the, the data gets um, sort of processed in, in um, Amazon web, web services and classified using a, an algorithm. 
And um, as some of the speakers have sort of mentioned before, like really important in, in monitoring um, schemes is, is that that feedback, that sort of um, ownership of the data that the um, that the uh, volunteers get back. So ending right at the end of this process is, is you know, the idea of this bespoke feedback that that each volunteer will get. So next slide, please. Oh, sorry, you can't see that. It's come up a bit funny on the on the slide. But basically, all of our um, PAM surveys, our passive acoustic monitoring surveys, are um, underpinned by a, a sort of methodology using audio MOF bat detectors. So these are full spectrum static bat detectors that we put out to record from dusk till dawn, um, and they have a 384 kHz sample rate. And the idea is that you put them out on a pole away from sort of interfering um, obstructions. Um, and record sort of three nights of data to, um, generally, uh, though the night watch survey we've only been recording one. So next slide, please. So in terms of uh, BBATs, the idea of this survey is that we set out to sort of plug those gaps in um, in habitats and geographical areas. So those mainly those upland areas, those areas that are difficult to get our volunteers to, and also uh, a range of species that we wanted to sort of uh, target in terms of getting that extra data that we could end up um, with sort of species trends for. Um, so if you can go on to the next slide, please, Nikki. Um, so generally, um, we have uh, trends, good trends for, for a lot of species in England, but this is a bit of a confusing slide, but bit sort of bit detailed. But really, all I want to draw your attention to is, is the question mark. So the bits that we have gaps for. Um, and you can see that they they are generally in Wales and Scotland. And then for some certain species, uh, we have some of these these red marks where we need to treat those trends with high caution. So if you go to the next slide, um, an example would be um, and click again, Nikki, would be um, the common pipistrelle and the soprano pipistrelle. Um, so, for example, we've got we've got good trends, you know, for these species, they're common species. But we've got two different surveys that do not corroborate each other. So as you can see that the summer roost counts are sort of tending to go down, uh, whereas our field survey transects are sort of looking like they're sort of increasing or getting stable. So um, and the reason for this is we have um, roost switching behaviour. So the idea with BBATS is we're going to plug that gap and be able to, you know, get some extra evidence to see what's actually going on with these species. So that's a species that's already been um, monitored seemingly well. Um, but then there's also species which we just have, you know, no, no trends on at the moment that we think BBATS will help with. So next slide, please. So, yeah, and again, click again, please. Yeah, so um, as I said, uh, hopefully BBATS will, will help with that. Um, but another survey that we feel that would be good to sort of tackle some of the other things that we've got as under representation in 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 our monitoring is the night watch survey so i'm not going to go into too much detail on this um because it's not actually part of the national bat monitoring program but it does have a very specific edi focus so um looking at gate engaging volunteers from from different backgrounds um to sort of tackle that under representation so next slide please so in terms of the key findings and lessons learned, so obviously these projects are still, um, you know, in development and, and, and ongoing and, and the BBATS um, project specifically targeting those sort of the species and habitats and everything. I think the key things that we've learned this year with with our pilot. So we've had a pilot and we've, uh, we've rolled out and managed to get data from 100 sites. And I think key things that we've learned is the value in learning from other schemes. So it's great to be part of, of this today um, and specifically related to BBATS. Um, we're trying to sort of look at other schemes to work out how to um, to work on our stratification and our weighting of site selection. So um, hopefully we'll be able to 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 offer a range of sites that um, volunteers can select. Um, but weighted towards those habitats and, and maybe regions that um, that we have underrepresented currently in monitoring. Um, there's also value in partnerships. So as part of um, the Nightwatch project, we've been working with PTES um, to um, to set up sort of the survey to include other mammals and other animals, as well as uh, looking at the acoustic um, PAM element. Um, the next lesson we've learned is the importance of designing surveys with with data integration in mind. So 
looking to the future, will we be able to uh, include all of this diff different type of data, the existing national buck monitoring program data, but also maybe these new surveys and integrate those data to be able to produce even more robust um, trends for different species. And the last uh, lesson is uh, basically that these acoustic surveys generate a lot of data. So um, it's been a bit of a, a challenge sort of dealing with that data and dealing with storage. So um, yeah, so next slide, thanks from me. And um, any questions, um, you're happy to answer. Thanks. Thanks very much, Leah. That was great um, and very relevant um, to feed into one of our discussion sessions later on. So I suspect um, there'll be lots more useful input that you can put into those um, chats later on as well. Well, we'll move on to our next series of um, uh, talks, which are all about birds. Um, so the first of these is from um, Teresa Frost, who is the web manager at BTO. So over to you, Teresa. Thanks very much. Morning, everybody. Um, so yes, so I run the Wet and Bird Survey at BTO with a, a small team, um, and we've also, as was um, said earlier, recently taken on the Goose and Swan monitoring program. Um, so I'll say a little bit about that at the end if I have time. Um, uh, so if I could have the next slide, please. So all of the talks this morning, actually, um, or the next session, um, are issues that we've had to deal with with web. So I recognise them all, but I, I thought I'd pick one that has been particularly um, pertinent to us over the past few months, um, and that's one of uh, staff retirement. So this is something that hopefully is common to, to everyone will know the perils of, of losing key members of staff. Um, and we've got a, a, a member of the team, Graham, he's a research ecologist in the wetland and marine team who's been working on webs and, and related surveys for well over 20 years. So there's a lot of experience to lose. The good thing about retirement is that you know it's going to happen before it happens, so it's a bit easier than when somebody just gets a new job, of course. Um, so one of the first thing to work out was how was what he, what we were losing basically and what what graham actually did um which is quite a lot and um, so he oversees the analytical side of things for the annual our annual output so our um our annual reporting um so that was an obvious one um but then he also writes and maintains the code for a lot of our other outputs so our data request service um, we have we do contract work for for different organisations looking at within site analyses, um, which are called sector plots, and then we have a lot of protected sites work, including every three years the web's alerts work. So there there were our sort of big things that we knew that Graham did, but then there was a lot of softer stuff as well. Um, that just his 20 years of experience means that he knows the database, he knows what it changed from this database system to that database system. What decisions were taken, why, what all these obscure tables actually held and all of that kind of thing. So we've started to try and, um, um, and collate that information together. And also just um, with a survey that's been going as long as Webs, which is over 75 years, but um, 55 years for our analysis period, how we deal with all of that. So there was a lot, a lot, there was a lot out of knowledge within Graham that we need to try and extract. Um, so the timing was was quite good in a way and that we were, had been tasked to start thinking about the analytical methods that we use for webs, um, particularly thinking about the waterbird indicator and, and how um, we might change the way to make our trends more representative. Um, so we had a piece of work looking at that and a, and a sort of byproduct of that was looking at the code that exists and this, the, um, the person who was doing the review, Philip, to identify that yes, the code is well commented, um, but you can't just look at the end analytical methods. You have to look at the whole framework um, and have things that that work year after year. Um, it takes us a good few weeks to run our annual number crunch and, and it's all got to work. So he kind of analyzed that there was a bit of a of a need to, to update the code base um, and, and make sure it was going to be maintained into the future as Graham has been doing um, up to now. Um, so that presented us with a little bit of a problem in that um, uh, the technologies have changed over the years. So um, we used to have a lot of expertise at BCO in SAS, which is a, an industry standard program that's really good at dealing with big data sets. Um, but these days we've got a lot of research colleges at BCO over um, probably 20 or 30, but a lot of them are coming out of university with knowledge of R, 
um, and they don't have that coding experience in SAS. So we, we've got a lack of people in house who would be, able, you know, if we had a problem the week after Graham left, who would be able to fix it. We've also got a team of um, a database team who know a lot about Oracle, and that's where the data is stored. So we started thinking, well, let's sort of take this opportunity to, to you know, move the systems across to where we've got people, so we've got a bit more um, ability to cope and not be too dependent on one or two people. Um, so that's what we've been doing over the past six months, starting to, to move some of the code base um, across into these other systems. Probably won't be all of it, and it's going to take some time, and I don't think it's going to be finished before Graham goes. But it, the key thing is that we started that process and started getting multiple members of the organisation knowing what's where and, and how it all fits together. Um, and that's within my team, in the surveys team, um, and also the research teams, particularly the wetland and marine research team, and in our information services team and the database team. So it's quite a, a big group um, and using that expertise across the board. Um, so next slide, please. So I just thought I'd share some some key thoughts that I had um, from this process. Um, one is that, you know, in the biological recording work, BTO is quite big in the company world, obviously, it's quite small. But even even when you've got 20 research colleges, that doesn't mean that you've got 20 people who can just pick something up and, and run with it. Um, it's quite hard to to get redundancy because whenever something needs doing, you never have much time and you always just give it to the person who can just do it rather than giving it to somebody who will take time to learn it. Um, and, it, you know, that's a hard thing to manage, but it, it's it's worth remembering that sometimes it is better to let somebody else struggle through just so that they learn. Um, obviously, co-commenting is really important, but it's a bit dangerous to just think that because code is commented, somebody else can pick it up and, and mend it um, because different people approach coding in different ways. Um, I'm sure this one's familiar to everybody that documentation and handover notes, we all know that we should have them. I wonder how many of us do. I know that when I started at BTO, I started a manual and within about two weeks I was working on other things and, and it's never been finished. So we'll, we'll try and work on that again with Graham going. Um, and yeah, our, our methods haven't changed with words particularly. We, we're still using pr pretty much what we were using in the 1990s to analyse the data, but the Everything else has changed, computing has changed, and, and so things do need to be kept up to date. And as I've said, you know, SAS might well be the best tool for the job, um, but thanks, Kirsty. Um, but sometimes you have to make that trade off and saying, well, if more people know R, then perhaps we'll have to use R, even if it's not the best um, programming language for this particular task. Um, this was a big thing to, to get started, and what we did was identify one of the mem one of the parts of what Graham did that that was a good starting point for Ian, who's the main person who's been learning to 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 learn how webs works, and um, which was the data request side of things. And the bonus of that was that we knew that a lot of the code could then be reused for for the other analysis programs. Um, and we started to to do that a bit better and thinking, well, instead of just copying that code across, you know, we'll we'll build a package and and call things properly so that we're only having to maintain the minimum amount of code that we need to. Um, and it all takes time, so we've got a lot left to do, even though we'd started this uh, quite a long time ago. Um, and then, yeah, uh, my last point was just um, with the Goose and Swan Martian programme, where it's been extremely challenging trying to, to get that up and running from moving from WWT um, to us. And one of the problems we've had is that there was very little documentation. And in, indeed, we haven't sort of had copies of, of what the database structure was like or any of that. Um, and that's all really key part of the scheme and just saying well you know for webs or people go out and count birds once a month and that's all you need to know isn't isn't really how a survey uh, handover works so thinking about what you need as a whole for the survey is really important thank you very much thanks very much Teresa that was a really interesting insight um, and I suspect will be a challenge that lots of our organizations will face over the years um, so moving on um, then next we've got, uh, contrary to what the slide says, we've actually got a triple bill of Dawn Barmer, which is exciting. Um, hopefully you're there, Dawn. Yeah, hello. <laughs> yeah, sorry Hi. about this. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much for uh, okay. stepping in with Dave not being able to attend. That's right, yeah. yeah. Apologies from Dave today. Yeah, he's just, uh, 
got other priorities, unfortunately, this morning. So I was going to talk first about the Avian Demographic Scheme, which is the BTO's ringing scheme and the Nest Record Scheme. So that's what that project is. So next slide, please. So, of course, you'll be completely familiar with uh, the issue I'm going to talk about today, which is um, avian flu. And this has had a really massive impact um, this summer on our seabird colonies. So a lot of ringers are very interested in seabirds and there's some extremely long running um, projects uh, undertaken on seabirds. Uh, so our co colonies around the coast, but also at inland sites. So at the start of the 2022 breeding season, you know, it became apparent that avian flu was a really big issue and affecting um, some seabird colonies initially in Scotland around the gannets and the great skewers. And this really led to really significant concerns about individual and population level impacts and um, the potential for you know, making things worse by carrying out our monitoring activities, be it going into a colony to sort of catch and ring birds or actually through monitoring. So I'll touch on the seabird monitoring programme um, later. So actually by going into a colony to count birds and causing birds to flush and mix with each other, you know, could, could that be making the situation worse? Next, please. So um, within ringing, um, BTO issue the licenses on behalf of the country nature conservation body. So if there were going to be any restrictions imposed on ringing, this is a responsibility of those CNCBs. And of course, they would be informed by the latest information from DEFRA and AFA. And BTO's role here is to um, advise the implications uh, advise on the implications and, and give the information back out to the volunteers. So we are the key, key person that communicates with all the volunteers. So what happened with the seabirds quite early on is um, discussions with Nature Scott um, led to a suspension of seabird ringing in Scotland. So very quickly BTO established a forum of the con nature conservation bodies, DEFRA, AFA and other NGOs to improve data sharing and maximise this Britain and Ireland coordination. So we were meeting on a, a weekly basis um, throughout the summer and now every two weeks to have this whole Britain and Ireland picture, which was really important. So we developed um, very quickly best practice guidance with respect to volunteers and bird welfare and issued that to our bird ringers. And we've got a programme of work going on um, to assess the impacts of um, avian flu, predict species of greatest future risk and we're obviously working in collaboration with JMCC, RSPB and others and one key area that I'm involved in is how we can collect um, more robust mortality data. Next slide please. So the issue there is obviously um, avian flu, it's not, it wasn't a part of our work programme um, but suddenly it was taking up a lot of time to organise the meetings, have the meetings and the communication back with volunteers. And as with COVID, we found that um, coordination at the scale of Britain and Ireland incredibly important to hear from everybody. So what we didn't really want is for individual countries to be making decisions, um, but then having consistencies across the country, which leads to you know, a lot of effort put into volunteer management. So yeah, one question that Dave should, you know, said who, who should really be taking this um, Britain and Ireland scale sort of coordination. So we did it because we needed to really, really quickly get something set up, but it's a question to think about. And really that um, engagement with all the, um, everybody should include all the stakeholders. So obviously a big part of ringing is that you need the permission of a landowner before you go ringing on the site. So actually having those major landowners involved in those early discussions um, was really important. And, you know, because if a landowner says you can't come on, even though, say, seabird ringing is permitted in the country, that can have quite a big Im impacts on, on um, volunteers. So we found that actually, you know, having really prompt, clear communication with the volunteers was essential, and um, sometimes almost weekly updates um, to ringers uh, um, telling them how the situation uh, was changing across the different countries. And this really did need to um, involve quite a significant investment in time um, to, to do this. And really, um, Dave says here, decisions can only be made on the basis of available information. So, um, we, you know, we need to really give good, really excellent guidance to, to the volunteers. So next slide, please. Yep. 
Yeah, so um, the lessons learned is obviously we need much more, um, thank you, Kirsty, much more regular communication between the BTO and SNCBs uh, to really explain the value um, of our volunteer data sets. So, you know, simply saying, you know, you can't do this this year uh, has a really huge impact on those long term data sets. And, and as we move forward, you know, already thinking about the summer of 23, how we might sort of manage the situation is, is, is really important. So, you know, thinking about those long term data sets and how we can uh, potentially keep them going. And as Dave said, you know, the current model of extensive volunteer monitoring is very exposed to changes in land manager risk perception. And this is something that uh, cropped up um, during the summer with individual landowners making decisions about whether um, bird ringers could, could access land. So I think that sums it up. Um, it's something we weren't really expecting to have to deal with this year. And it's taken a sort of huge amount of time. Um, to, to work with everybody and to communicate effectively to our volunteers. Thank you. Okay, the next one is the Breeding Bird Survey. Um, we're actually in the stage of uh, having just recruited a new national organiser who's going to be starting in November for the BBS because Sarah Harris, who was a BBS organiser, is now our national organiser for the Seabird Monitoring Programme. So what I'm going to be talking about today is the impact of COVID-19. Next slide, please. And obviously, you'll be well aware that in 2020, um, COVID really impacted um, the field work, which could be done by our volunteers. In fact, 49% fewer surveys um, squares were visited compared to the previous year. And the um, reductions were greatest in Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland, where the restrictions on movement um, lasted the longest. And of course, we have two visits for BBS, an early visit and a late visit. So for virtually all of us, we were unable to make our early breeding season visits. So yeah, 90 percent fewer visits were made in that early period. So the question we were faced um, is, could we produce any trends um, for 2020? And our clever folk here um, undertook some analytical work to assess the impacts and to investigate any statistical solutions. And this led to um, a paper, next bullet point please, um, published in Bird Study, which my colleague Simon Gillings led on um, to talk about um, yeah, basically what, what we, we could do. Next, please. And next. So as I said, the greatest reductions were in Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland and that early part of the breeding season. So what we were able to do in the, in the end was to produce um, some trends for England only. So we were able to produce long term trends, um, 95 to 2019 and the one year change, 2019 to 2020, for just 20 species in England. And for an additional 37 species, we could either um, we could produce either the long term trends or just the one year trends. Then obviously moving on to um, 2021, actually field work was really good. Um, volunteers went out and we were only just uh, short of our 2019 a number of squares. So I would say, yeah, really fantastic return to field work. But thinking about the trends, you know, how could we uh, or could we even produce anything for that one year change 20 to 21? In fact, we, we didn't, we couldn't. Um, so we ended up presenting a two year trend um, for 2019 to 21. Next, please. And so I'm just sort of telling you um, what our statistician told me. Um, he said uh, we, we, we um, smoothed spline, which is the line, is fitted to the unsmoothed indices, but it left out 2001, which is the foot and mouth year, and 2020. And this is predicted all over all the years, including those two missing years. So in simple terms, we are able to use some statistical techniques to produce our long term trends um, to 2021. So um, I mean, it was a lot more complicated than that, I can assure you, but uh, it does mean that we can continue our long term trends. And here our use of our BBS reports um, was really important. So in 2020, when actually we had very little and um, few results to present just those England trends. We, we really filled the report with examples of how BBS data has been um, 
you know, used over the years and had a re really big section about the impact of COVID and, and what it meant for the trends. So I think that's the BBS, thank you. And uh, just moving on to the seabird monitoring programme. So this is now um, Sarah Harris. Um, having any meeting in October when you have a, a office full of bird watchers, it, it means uh, invariably away bird watching in, in October. So apologies from Sarah, she's having a, a lovely time in East Yorkshire at the minute. So Sarah's taken on um, the role of national organiser for the seabird monitoring programme. And this is a new scheme to BTO. We're really delighted to take on the scheme um, on the 4th of July this year. So it's quite new in partnership with JNCC as a partner and RSPB as an associate partner. Next, please. So the problem I'd like to talk about here is how we, um, when you're taking on a new scheme, reach out to all the participants. And I think one of the key differences for us um, with SMP is that not all of the participants are volunteers. So there's actually quite a lot of people who um, undertake the, the field work as professionals, say, for example, working for a National Trust Scotland RSPB. So there's a whole host of people out there who um, are not strictly volunteers. One of the first, first things we had to do was um, transfer the volunteers from JNCC to BTO and then really think about how we can start to recruit um, new volunteers, but also retain the volunteers that have been working on SMP for many years. Next, please. So right from day one, um, we started to set up um, meetings with the professionals and the key stakeholders. A part of the Seabird Monitoring Programme is that there are key sites, uh, four key sites, um, in, in Scotland and one in Wales, three in Scotland, one in Wales, and to really start up that um, good commu communication right from the start. Um, just before we ha um, had the transfer of the scheme, JNCC emailed volunteers to um, confirm their personal data could be transferred from JNCC to, to BTO. And initially 67% responded, yes, that's fine. 24% we didn't hear from at all. Um, 7% of emails addresses were undeliverable and 2% said no. So we were obviously able to transfer that 67% from JNCC to BTO successfully. That was good. But how do we capture the people that are registered for SMP have, you know, did have access to the database, but haven't responded to um, say that we can now contact them under the, the new um, partnership. So of the people that did respond, we started um, communication by email and social media. So we, we started to, to get to know our volunteers. Next, please. So we had to adapt pretty quickly because we knew that there was a um, you know, reasonable percentage of people that hadn't responded. Either you know, they just failed to respond or their email address was not done. You know, not, not working. So we actually adapted our login system. So these are people that previously had access to the database, which BTO hosted for several years anyway. So when they tried to log in, we had a pop up um, come up to say, look, you haven't yet ticked the box to say you've read the privacy policy and T's and C's. So we asked them to do that on the screen and then give them immediate access to the database or an option to email the organizer. And we hope that this would capture a few people that had missed the email but still wanted to take part in SMP and, and indeed it did so we managed to get a few more people but there's still quite a number of people out there which you know were, were actively um, participating in SMP that haven't haven't been in touch with us next please so we also set up a Twitter account and we use this to engage with existing participants and also try to recruit new participants. And again, just through this uh, mechanism, we found a few of the volunteers, they've come forward to say they still want to take part and we've managed to get them set up um, by yeah, approving the privacy policy and T's and C's. Next, please. But we still don't know everybody. Um, a bit like webs actually, that um, some of the counts are done um, in teams. So a team of people might go to a site to to count the birds and we just might have the name of the one person that submits the data so what we'd really like to do is get to know everybody that takes part in SMP so we can feedback results to them and give them information throughout the year so that's one challenge we have is how do we get to know 
about everybody that's actually participating in the scheme. Next, please. And it's really, you know, I think we knew this already, but um, what we do certainly do from other schemes, that's actually we need really good resources for volunteers and, and we have an urgent need for a new uh, handbook. A hand, the handbook was last written in, uh, and updated in 1995, so there's quite an urgent need to review the methods being used and potentially make updates to the database so um, sort of new data can be submitted and actually have a much more user-friendly um, yeah, PDF or whatever we want it to be for volunteers um, so it's, it's easier for them to participate and we can remove some of the, the barriers around participation. So it's been really, um, yeah, really busy few months Lot, really steep learning curve um, to, to take on a new, new scheme but yeah I thought I wanted to share about that the issue around this sort of transfer of volunteers and getting to know your participants when you when you start up um, when you take on a new scheme okay that's me done thank you thanks very much Dawn um, for yeah all that information about all three schemes that's that's been really interesting um, and thank you very much to all of our speakers um, that's Concludes, concludes our six minute talk, um, whistle stop tour of everyone's schemes. Um, so we're going to move on to um, the breakout groups in uh, a minute. So I, I'm gonna give you a bit of an introduction and then we'll have sort of five minutes for everyone to have a quick leg stretch, um, toilet break and find your way into the breakout rooms. Um, and then we will um, be in our breakout rooms for about an hour and 10 minutes before we come back together at the end of the meeting. So um, the top two topics we wanted to think about today, um, this first one um, links back to a couple of the talks that we've had uh, this morning um, and is around sort of effective strategies for improving survey coverage. So um, we've we've, as I said, we've heard about a couple of schemes experience in this, but I think it um, it can be a, a challenge across the schemes um, and so we'd really like to think quite broadly about different strategies that um, different schemes have tried recently to tackle um, kind of your schemes issues with um, uh, areas that are currently poorly represented um, be that in sort of remote areas or areas with low um, human population density or where particular species aren't well recorded um, and then the other angle of this um, that I know a lot of us have been thinking around um, is uh, strategies for working more with underrepresented demographics and sort of thinking about what's worked there. Um, so the sort of three areas we wanted to think about here were what approaches you've tried, um, what's worked and what hasn't worked um, and what approaches are you wanting to try. Um, um, what we're um, sort of hoping is that people can bring to the discussion um, anything um, that they've tried around particular technologies, communication strategies, targeted engagement attempts to fill um, particular gaps. Um, and we'll have a jam board within breakout groups to try and capture all this. Um, and there'll be a facilitator um, and a scribe to capture anything that um, you yourselves aren't putting on the jam board. Um, and we can discuss this. Um, at the end of the session, um, when we all come back together at quarter past one, we're hoping facilitators can feedback um, two key messages from discussions. So that could be around the strategies that have been have worked or that haven't, um, or kind of lessons learned, because we recognise these conversations could go in quite different directions depending on who's in your different groups. Um, and then we're hoping we can kind of collate all this information to share after the event um, for everyone here's use in the future um, to look at um, strategies that have worked. And as we try and think about what we want to try in our scheme, um, we can look at what others have already tried and um, build on those past experiences. So that's um, for one session um, uh, that we're going to think about first. And then the second breakout group um, is this uh, challenges around um, national and local biodiversity data join up. So, um, I expect a lot of you are, are aware that there is um, increasing interest across countries um, and lots of stakeholders um, that we work with in JNCC in particular, but I expect that you also work with um, or you are these stakeholders in, in actual fact. Um, 
uh, in that we want to understand biodiversity change better um, at a kind of more local level. So um, our national species surveillance schemes can provide really good information on what's happening across um, kind of countries as a whole, um, but they don't necessarily deliver the spatial resolution that is required to um, do things like feeding into local nature recovery strategies in England or um, assessments of area statements in Wales. Um, and this is this is fine. This is what our national schemes um, were designed to do. They're designed to um, give us the national picture and they're not originally designed to serve um, this kind of more regional and local function. But with kind of increasing recognition of the uh, this local evidence gap, um, lots of people are looking at citizen science to potentially be an option to um, support additional data collection um, at more local scales. And this, uh, we recognise, can come with a lot of challenges um, and questions. Um, for example, how much and when is it appropriate for us to align local monitoring efforts with national species surveillance um, in terms of methods used or um, data flows? So within TPOP and across the sector more widely, we really want to start discussing these challenges um, associated with this kind of whole area um, and to think about some solutions. So. Um, yeah, we, we really want to kind of try and find some some solutions rather than make more problems. Um, and this is a really big topic and we could discuss it for days probably. Um, so we've tried, tried to kind of focus it down to three key questions on the screen. Um, the, uh, these are around what challenges can be identified in the application of um, national schemes data to influence local decision making, such as um, these local nature recovery strategies. Um, secondly, what are the challenges um, with there being a kind of influx of local data um, coming to national schemes potentially, um, or if this if this local data exists um, and is collected, how would we then view it um, alongside or with national schemes? Um, and then finally, can we think of any solutions or kind of proactive things that we as TPOC could do um, in relation to these challenges to kind of make joining these two scales um, work essentially in the future. Um, so um, we'll definitely be discussing this more in the coming months, um, but we really want to get this conversation started today. OK, so um, we've got a couple of points of feedback. Um, I think if we just go around the groups um, and we'll do feedback from the first discussion session first. So um, so I'm not picking on myself first. I'll go to the yellow group. Uh, is that Hannah? Are yeah, it is. Feedback? I, was, I mean, yes, <laughs> but I was hoping you wouldn't pick on me first, but there we go. Um, well, I think an important point, though, is that there is quite a lot of interlinkage between both these um, questions and these discussions. Um, but just to pick on some of the things that have worked well in thinking about increasing um, geographic coverage, BTO spoke a bit about the roving um, recording for uplands and taking the taking sort of that approach to relax some of the methods to to encourage people to to carry out surveys in in under recorded upland areas um and sort of the fact the consequences that has in terms of the fact that people have actually as a consequence taken up some of those squares that were previously unused um in terms of um other uh, opportunities thinking about um uh training workshops that sort of take place in different areas of the country rather than necessarily just focusing them in the same areas um, around the fact that the challenges in urban and um, rural areas are somewhat um, different because of uh, for in urban areas it's not necessarily um, a lack of people it's more of a uh, making it relevant to those local areas is where we get into the sort of linkage with the local side of things um, and then thinking about approaches um, for trying this and thinking about sort of some of the automated classification software that may um, assist folk um, who are not necessarily currently um, involved in in data recording and sort of enabling participation, but thinking about how you then bridge that gap into becoming like a specialist recorder and, and sort of thinking about that's sort of something that I think people were interested in in thinking about is sort of going through from those sort of introductory opportunities through to sort of the more skilled, um, because obviously that's not something that everybody wants to do, but for those who do want to become that, you know, thinking about that. So yeah, that's a ramble, Great. but it's for you there. Thanks, Hannah. Um, Kirsty, do you want to give us a couple of key points from the 
green group. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Um, we were also looking at how those two subtopics were kind of very much overlapping and um, things like, for instance, uh, different kind of EDI groups uh, could be used to plug in gaps in certain areas, but not in others and things. Um, so the key messages would be very much uh, make, making you best use of existing volunteers and um, uh, expanding the volunteer uh, base to other groups um, and do it quite often what would help would be partnerships with other schemes and organizations to help extend the coverage so that um, if you got uh, uh, one scheme doing surveying in a particular area then uh, try and target um, another sampling uh, for a different taxa, for instance, into the same area, hopefully even using the same set of volunteers, or in the case of those schemes where we've got a lot of, um, say, uh, nature reserve site managers and things involved, then have them feeding into uh, more than one uh, survey scheme. And also use that kind of partnership working in some areas like uh, various remote sites, uh, which are perhaps become more important now with all the economic crisis, fuel prices and everything else, and um, then expand uh, the volunteer base to uh, uh, in population centres to the different EDI groups uh, to encourage these new uh, volunteers who are perhaps not quite so engaged yet to make them more engaged. And second key message that we came up with is that the feedback to volunteers is an absolute key in maintaining their interest and seeing the value of what they're doing uh, as part of the bigger picture. Great, thanks very much, Kirsty. Um, just a quick bit of feedback from our group um, on the first topic on effective strategies for improving survey coverage. Um, we were hearing um, about uh, plant life success in um, or kind of work on contacting universities um, to join up with university courses and um, the fact that this is potentially quite a good way of engaging a, a group of um, or demographic that we might not be um, working with so frequently in university students um, uh, and often then you get the same kind of supervisor managing a square but you you get the influx of new students each year so you can kind of inspire um, lots of different generations of students but you do get some consistency from the supervisor but the really time consuming thing about that is um, finding out actually who should be contacting in university and forging those links so potentially there's something we could do there as TPOP in terms of um, working um, I guess working together to find out who those key contacts are and sharing information on that um, and providing more of a kind of teapot package of uh, um, schemes to get involved with rather than a sort of scheme specific um, offering. Um, and then the other quite interesting um, point which we were discussing which um, I will segue nicely into my feedback with a second uh, point I think as well is around um, the success in um, in ARC as a particular example here in terms of um, you can provide volunteers with options of where to survey based on sort of sampling frameworks but actually if you open up the floor to allow volunteers to choose the sites that they're interested in surveying um, yes some some volunteers will do this but actually it provides quite a nice pathway to them then getting involved in surveying um, samples uh, or sites from the sampled um, network as well so as a sort of um, way to get more people involved, um, that might be quite a nice way of doing it. Um, and um, also that may apply then to this kind of local um, focus in getting more local data, because if you are encouraging kind of local data collection um, in more self-selected sites, then this may then be a nice way to support um, the wider TPOP national survey if you're um, recruiting those new people and getting that interest. Um, so you're hopefully um, achieving both aims at kind of local and national levels. Um, and then I'll I'll just do my second bit of feedback from the other bit as uh, the second topic as well before passing back to Kirsty and Hannah, which was um, this kind of view that um, 
quite a lot of time is taken by uh, schemes responding to landowners saying what what can we do in terms of monitoring um, tax on X, Y or Z on our uh, site um, and actually if we could provide kind of more standardised guidance um, possibly um, spanning across taxa um, in terms of what those landowners should do um, on a more um, uh, consistent um, in a more consistent way then that would potentially free up more time for dealing with almost more bespoke questions around how to um, survey the tax are on, on more unusual sites potentially but there's, there's definitely an opportunity that TPOC could work together around that. Um, so I'll pass back to, we'll go the opposite direction, pass back to Kirsty for any more thoughts on the second topic. Yeah okay, um, one thing that really came out loud and clear in our conversation was that uh, uh, to help with of scale of monitoring from local through to national, uh, having shared protocols, um, both in terms of um, uh, awareness of um, the sampling thresholds, uh, so how much sampling you would need at the scale uh, you were looking at the monitoring, and also the sampling methods, standardized sampling methods recommended. So to have that kind of information uh, widely available and known to people will help with um, integrating the data at whatever scale it is collected and looked at. Um, and the other is kind of the practicalities of um, uh, communicating uh, a little bit sort of linked to what you're already saying, Nikki, um, about uh, um, the time element, particularly for national schemes, uh, of engaging in the more uh, localised uh, either data provision or data requests or anything. Um, so if it was possible to get some kind of network set up, uh, all going all the way from local record centres uh, through to the national schemes, to get that kind of communication link so that people know what's where and uh, will have better chance of making use of the data on different scales. Uh, currently, one of the big bottlenecks seems to be uh, the time element for the national schemes to be physically able to uh, engage in this kind of um, uh, networking. Um, but hopefully in the future, there's possibilities of uh, getting something set up to try and uh, make those networks work better. Great, thanks, Kirsty and Hannah. Just for the last yeah, minute or so, I'll try and do a, a speed speed uh, feedback. So, um, in terms of thinking about um, influx of local data and thinking about the challenges for verifiers, um, there was a bit of a discussion about you know the increase now actually in it not being just an individual verifier and teams of verifiers and creating best practice guidance such that that more than than a handful of people can participate in verification. Um, in terms of thinking about the application of national scheme data to influence local decision making, um, there was a clear po clear point around communications and being careful um, on the sort of like context context and the sort of actual inference that can be made. Um, at a local level and sort of not placing too much weight um, when making those sort of local decisions and then thinking about local project data coming through to the national and thinking about methods and sort of by design having um, consistent and strategically aligned methodologies so that they can be applied um, through from the local level to the national etc so yeah that's my great thank you very much um, so I think uh, we are coming to a close um, miraculously about on time and I'm sure we're all very hungry. Um, so I just wanted to finish off with a few next steps um, to say we will put the recording of this event on YouTube. Um, so anyone who's not here can go and watch it or anyone who is here who wants to relive it can go and relive it whenever they want. Um, we'll write up um, uh, an event report um, similar to how we have done in previous years to try and capture some of these discussions. Um, and um, we will circulate a feedback form at some point, probably after all the TPOP events, which I appreciate is quite a long way in the, in the future to then remember back to this event. But um, please do um, 
provide any feedback um, to us if you want, because we're keen that these events work for you into the future. So um, if you uh, want to want us to change the way we do this or anything in the future, um, then do let us know if you've got any ideas. So um, this kind of TPOP engagement is really working for, for you in terms of being what's really useful. Um, and finally, yeah, we really hope we'll see you at some other events um, throughout the autumn. And thanks again very much for all your time and your thoughts this morning. Um, it's uh, been a really interesting discussion and great presentations from everybody we heard from earlier. So thanks very much, everyone.